Hello chaps and chapesses, and this week we're going to talk about how to organise your kit on the flats and we're going to prevent the faff bat attack. So there are tons and tons of videos about what kit you should take with you when you go on a saltwater fly fishing trip, but there's no one to actually guide you through the process of what you do with all of that kit once you get on the flats. How many times have you turned up for your first day's fishing? You're all excited, everything's going bananas. What happens is what I describe as the faff bat. All your kits all over the place. You don't know which kit to take out what day. You don't know whether you need to set up your eight weight or your nine weight or your 10 weight or your 12 weight. You've got kit exploded out of your bag that you've spent the last nine to 10 months collecting and hoarding and carefully putting in different compartments in your bag. So now is the time to actually put all of that kit into practice. And I can tell you right off the bat that half the stuff we take, we don't need. So what I want to talk to you about is streamlining your kit and how you actually organize yourself when you're wading on the flats, when you're hunting bonefish or permit or giant trevally. This is by no means the be all and an end all of all the kit that you possibly could need, but this is just my own thoughts on how I have managed to streamline my kit flow, if you like, from spending quite a few years on the salt flats. So let's start at the bottom and we will start with boots. Boots is very dependent upon where you're going to go in the world. Not everywhere that you go flats fishing requires you to wear big solid walking style boots and you can quite often get away with neoprene booties or the neoprene ankle boots. So for example if you're going to go and fish in Los Roques I wear the short neoprene wading boot variety because I like to be able to pull my boots on and off getting in and out of a boat. I don't want to have them on my feet all the time and it's not necessary and there's nothing there which uh, requires you to have the protection that you would require, for example, the boot that you're going to use in the Seychelles. The next stage up from that uh, is the sort of Christmas Island style neoprene booty that covers your ankles. That'll cover you for most major flats situations where you're walking over marl or you're walking over sand flats. But as soon as you venture into coral, that's when you need to start taking care of your feet because quite often the coral can puncture the bottom of the boot. If you get coral in your foot, it can cause an extremely nasty infection, so you've got to be very careful. If you're looking at flats fishing somewhere in the Indian Ocean, for example, some of the outer atolls that we hunt the GTs on, you definitely want very serious boots because not only is there sharp coral, but there's also cone shells and various other little things that you need to be very aware of when you're wading around on those flats. So in that situation, you want the big, clumpy mile walker, uh, flat sneaker, or I am now using the Sims Vapor Tread, which is a really, really solid boot. There's a link to it in the description up here. Boots are the first thing. So what goes underneath your boots? Underneath your boots, for a long time, we just wore wet wading socks or old sports socks or something like that, which is fine, they do the job. But what happens is you end up getting sand down inside your boot. And as you wade, the sand fills up and it can be extremely uncomfortable. The first thing that we did to combat that was to start wearing gravel guards as if you were using waders. So little neoprene guards that go around your ankles, cover the top of your boot and prevent the sand getting in. But recently, in the last, couple of years I've started using the Sims combination sock which is a combination of a neoprene sock and a gravel guard and these are an absolute godsend. They are the easiest thing to deal with when you're dealing with big saltwater boots. You pull them on in the morning and then you flip up the gravel guard, put the boot on and just flip it down over the top. And I have found for example in Sudan that these gave me an enormous amount of not only support but protection around my ankles and my lower leg which prevented me from getting cut on coral. So those are your different types of boots. Boots will depend on where you're going. The next thing that I want to talk about moving further up your leg is what you wear either as shorts or trousers on your legs. Those of you who are good in the sun, I'm sure that you like to wear shorts. I obviously being a vague Scottish and mildly ginger extraction tend to hide my legs away from the world because otherwise they tend to go red, burn and peel which is not a particularly pleasant experience. So if you're gonna go the shorts route, shorts is fine, but if you're gonna do a lot of wading or wet wading, I would highly recommend that you get a pair of Lycra cycling shorts. Not just because they feel nice, no, I'm kidding, um, but because what they do is protect you from chafe on the inside of your thighs. And I have been on long outbound saltwater trips where people by the end of the week who are wearing fancy boarding shorts, 
couldn't even walk because they'd actually rubbed such nasty sores on the inside of their thighs. Incidentally, always carry Bepanthin baby cream or Sudocrem to get rid of those during the course of the week. Absolutely fantastic. So, like cycling shorts underneath your shorts, if you're gonna wear long trousers, a lot of people like to wear long trousers and cover it up, but what I have discovered is that if you're going to wear long trousers or the zip-off variety, and you're gonna do a lot of wading in thigh depth water, you will find that you'll get really tired because you're dragging around an enormous amount of extra drag in the water. Um, and the lower part, especially if you're wearing gravel guards, fills up with water when you get out. So it's a little bit uncomfortable. So what I've done these days is I have turned myself into a superhero. Um, and I wear Lycra full length trousers or leggings. Now I know that that looks a bit odd to begin with, but actually it is a technique which came, comes directly from New Zealand. Uh, in New Zealand, when they're wet wading for trout, they wear uh, leggings underneath their shorts. So they're essentially like full length lycra cycling shorts that come all the way down to your ankles. And the ones I find best for this purpose are ones which are built specifically for swimming. So for example, the Stingray Jammers, which I will leave a link in the description below. They are really, really good. SPF 50, they're designed to be in the water all the time. And they also offer a certain element of protection for coral and also jellyfish and other things that you can get stung on on the flats. So they're a really top tip. So next, let's talk shirts. Shirts have come an extremely long way in the last 20 years. When I first started flats fishing, um, the Columbia Bonehead shirt was the shirt that we all wore. Very lightweight, uh, synthetic material, SPF 50. Uh, nicely vented, it was your typical kind of flats fishing shirt at that time. But now things have moved on and we're now wearing far more technical style shirts, normally long style t-shirts. Uh, my favorites are the Gilt Pro Striker, which I will leave a link to up here. That's a great shirt because it keeps you very, very protected on the flats, but at the same time offers you freedom of movement and also it keeps you cool. Now there's many, many different brands, uh, Columbia, and various others make excellent shirts, but I would highly recommend that you take the time to invest in some technical flat shirts. It makes a huge difference to your comfort and well-being while you're wading around on the salt flats. It's a hot and harsh environment, so it is definitely worth investing in those style shirts over your t-shirts or long style tees. The next important piece of equipment is to have something that protects your neck your, and your lower face up to the edge of your nose because this can get absolutely fried, especially if you've got one of those days with a flat calm where you can barely see where the horizon and the sea line meet. So on those, on those really glassy days, you've got to make sure that you have protected uh, your nose especially, your ears, and the lower part of your face. So we all wear a buff or some kind of buff type protection gaiter. This is essentially a tube of SPF 50 material that you can pull up up and over the top of your mouth, over the top of the bridge of your nose, and allows you to actually breathe through it and protects you from the sun. Now those uh, Pro Striker shirts that I wear have got one built into it, so you just roll it down like a polo neck, which is extremely useful, um, but any buff or uh, SPF 50 protection gaiter will do the job, but it's a really important piece of kit to have with you. Now obviously on the flats, sunglasses, vital. If you can't see your fish, you might as well not be there. You may have flown four and a half thousand miles across the Atlantic, but if you can't see your quarry that you're trying to hunt, then you're essentially making life twice as difficult for yourself. So invest in a really good pair of sunglasses, uh, loads of different lens styles to choose from. Again, I'll link to a video that I made uh, on different lens colors and which colors you want to use in what situations. Incidentally, it's always very useful to have a spare pair with a different color tint for different conditions. And lastly, some kind of headwear. Whether you wear a baseball cap or whether you wear a Tilly style hat that comes right out, uh, far more sensible. Um, that protects the whole of the back of your shoulders and your neck. The sun is a savage creature. I know, I've checked. I quite like the baseball cap style, which are mesh backs, because I, um, I like the breeze that can come through, keeps your head cool. Your head is one of those areas that gets very, very hot. Actually, as another top tip, when you get really hot, put some cold water from the cooler in the top of your cap and stick it in your head. It brings your temperature down very, very quickly. So then we go to the actual organization of all of the lovely toys that you brought with you. There's two different 
methods, in my opinion, that you can do this. You either wear a flat style pack, or fanny pack as the Americans call it, which comes around your middle. And the flat pack is a easily accessible pack which you can get a certain amount of kit into. But you don't need to be carrying the world's supply of equipment in that. And if you are in one of those destinations which has a flat skiff nearby, I would recommend that you have a boat bag to put your spare kit in and just use your flat pack as your fighting kit, if you like. So that is really your rig for only going out to fish those particular areas that you're about to fish. So in that, I would normally be carrying things like a couple of fly boxes, one bonefish flies, uh, some permit flies perhaps, um, maybe a couple of other cuda flies stuck in my hat or something like that. Then I always carry lip lock, uh, the 50 SPF uh, lip lock because your lips are one of those things that always get burned. Then I carry various spools of tippet material. Then I carry some spare leaders. My leaders will be, for example, Rio Bonefish 8, 10, 13 and a half, 19 pound. I'll probably put a couple of those each in my flat pack and uh, corresponding leader material for tying tippets on the end of that. I'd also have uh, my saltwater pliers on the waist strap of my flat pack. They're always useful to have around and some kind of braided leader kit. You never know when you're going to get the tip of a fly line cut off on coral or some such thing like that. So I carry a little kit of 50 pound lubes, some super glue, a wire nail knot loop that I just use to do nail knots and then some nippers which I use to nip it all down and make it nice and tight. And I use the toenail clipper variety with the lever on it because then you can get a proper purchase rather than just the ordinary nippers. So if you're going to fish in a flats destination, that would be your normal rig, and then in your boat bag you would carry the other bits and pieces that you would normally carry with you. Then the other variety is to carry a backpack. Uh, this is the way that I tend to fish. I prefer to have everything in a backpack, and I like to keep my waist free for long wades. And it also means that it's all in one place. So in my backpack, this is a good game. In my backpack, I start with my hydration bladder. So I have a two liter hydration bladder, which I have cobbled together and put into my backpack. Here's a little video on how I do that. So that sits in the bottom of my bag. Um, on top of that, I have my rain jacket. We all buy a rain jacket to take on a flat strip. How rarely do we actually pull it out and use it? Take it with you. It's there, use it. Don't get wet, stay warm. Very helpful. So then on top of that, I carry my fly pack. Now this is the easiest way to carry large flies. So this is a special fly pack which has got Ziploc bags integrated inside. So all my flies are laid out lengthways and they are not squished in a box and you can put 40-50 flies, probably more, in one of these packs which takes up the same amount of space as one fly box. So space is key. At the end of the day, don't forget, you've got to carry all of this stuff. Carrying load across a flat when you're wading on water up to your thighs and you're going to do an eight kilometer wade for example that day whether you're in the Seychelles or Christmas Island then it's tiring you don't want too much kit so you need to narrow down exactly what you need so on, my, on top of my fly pack which I've got all my tarpon or GT flies I then carry my fly boxes so I normally carry two fly boxes I carry the CNF wet dry boxes which are sealed therefore they stop my fly is getting rusty. So in that I will normally have one which has got various crab patterns, shrimp patterns which I would use for trigger fish or permit or even big bones for that matter and the other one I carry a selection of bonefish flies depending on which destination I'm going to be at. So on top of my flies I then have a roll top wet dry bag uh, just a cheap overboard one, um, which I'll put a link in the description below. In that, I then carry spare fly lines you know, on my Omni Spool switch boxes uh, so that I can quickly change fly lines in and out while I'm on the flats or in a pitching boat. The crank handle, which you don't forget, that's a pain when that happens. So my spare lines, I will carry spare floating 9 weight, spare floating 12 weight. Quite often I'll carry a 600 grain sinking line so that I can use that for dredging if I find myself in a position at the bottom of a tide where the flats are out and I'm waiting for the tide to come back on again. It's great fun doing a bit of dredging off the edge, you never know what's going to climb on board. I will also carry my leader kit as I talked about beforehand so that I can chain braided loops for other people on the flats or myself. Uh, my saltwater pliers goes in there, make sure that they stay dry. I will also carry a certain amount of loo paper, what's also referred to as white gold because when you need it, you need it. And I also carry a pair of spare Polaroids, normally with a different lens 
tint. Uh, I normally carry my sunrise tint for bad lighting conditions. Those are my happy glasses. They're my see everything in the dark glasses, which are really, really useful. Spare pair of sun gloves. I always carry gloves of some shape or description. I wear those. So at the moment I'm wearing the Sims Guide ones with the leather palms. They work really well as a tailing glove as well as a sun protection glove. You don't want to get the backs of your hands burnt. That's really, really painful and not good for your skin at all. Also in my wet dry bag, I carry a Ziploc bag, which has got my spare sun cream in for my face, etc. Um, always keep it in a Ziploc bag because what happens is if it gets squashed in the boat and your sun cream explodes all over your bag and goes all over, all over your kit, that is a pain to deal with which I am speaking from experience. I also carry a mini Leatherman for various ongoing repairs, which is in my wet dry bag. And that can be used if a reel needs attention or it's got some grit in it and I can unscrew the bolts, etc., and uh, quickly do a quick field repair. That's a really useful piece of kit and the scissors can also be quite useful for thick mono if you haven't got a pair of pliers. And that's pretty much all I carry in my backpack. I know that doesn't seem like an awful lot, but actually that's heavy enough. So then on the outside of my backpack, I tend to keep everything on the left hand side, on the left hand side of my shoulders. So I have my spare rod holder tucked down the back and that is also included in that video that I was talking about, which shows you how to add a second rod to your backpack. Then I have my hydration tube that comes down my shoulder tucked in nicely here. Then I always carry a pair of forceps, just cheap ones, that I can have quickly and accessible, which I clip here, so that I can get at them quickly if I've hooked a bonefish, which I can't just pop the fly out with my finger. And quite often these days, I have a little GoPro, which I keep on my shoulder mount here. And it's just a clip, which clips onto my shoulder um, and just pops up my GoPro so that I can film some action when I'm wading across the flats. I find the little GoPros, the Hero Session 5s, something like that, they're the easiest to walk around with, although I think the video quality is probably better on the other ones. Last but not least, I carry my DSLR camera with me. I carry it in an overboard wet dry pack, which I can clip to my chest with a couple of carabiners. And when I'm not accessing it quickly, I quite often throw that in my backpack as well, or if I'm gonna do a deep wade. So make sure that you rationalize your kit so that you are not carrying excessive amounts of equipment. It's by all means, keep spares back on your lodge or your boat. Uh, you can bring your big fly boxes that you would then decant flies from that into your smaller ones. But try not to bring all of this stuff out on the flats with you, because all you will do is get confused. All you will do is start rummaging around going, oh, no, what, 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 I don't know what to carry. And the number of times that I've had to start pulling bits of kit off people who are trying to carry too much on the flats and they're becoming burdened with all the excessive equipment. Less is better. Think about how to rationalize it down to the succinct amount of kit that you actually need to be carrying. Well, I hope you find that video of use. And if you did, please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And I shall look forward to seeing you on the next one.